Are you ready? Yastu Sarvani Bhutani Atmavane Vanupasyati Sarva Bhuteshu Chatmanam Tatona Vijubhupshute Yasmin Sarvani Bhutani Atmayva Bhutijanataha Katroka Mahakasuka Katam Manupasyataha Sapaya Jakshuka Makayava Vranam, Ashnaviram Shudam Apapa Bhidham, Kabir Manisi Paribu Sayambo, Yatari Toritan Viradach Chispat, Divya Samap Vyaha. Antam Tamaham Pradeshanti, Vidyam Upasate, Tatabuya Ivate Tamo, Ya uvidyayam rataha Anyara Excuse me Anyare vahur vidyaya Anyara hura vidyaya Iti shushu madiranam Dinastad vidya chakshire Vidyam cha vidyam cha yas Tadbiro bayam saha Avidyayam ritam tirpa, vidyayam ritam ashnute. Antam tamaha pravishanti, ye sambhuti mupasate, tatabuya ivate tamo, yaru sambhuti mataha. Anyad ivahur sambhavar, anyarahur sambhavar, Iti shushu madiranam dinastad vija chakshire Sambhutim cha vinasam cha yastad viro vayam saha Dinasenam ritam tirpa sambhutam vrittam ashnute Iranayena patrena satyasya vihitam mukam tattam pucham apavrana satya dharma yadrishtaye Punchame karsi yamasuya prajapatya vyuharasmin samuhati jaha Tete rupam kalinam tamam tete pasyami yosata so purusha so hamashmi Bhayorani lamam ritam tedam bhashmatam shadiram om krita smara krita smara krita smara krita smara
Agnidaya Supataraya Asman Vishwani Deva Vayunani Vidvan Yoyasman Churhanam Eno Uyistam Te Nama Ukim Vidhema So today we're, we're reading, we're discussing verses 9 through 13. Is that correct? Or 14? 9 through 11. 9 through 13 or 14? 14. Um, I think I prepared 9 through. We have 10 verses. 5, 5, 3, 5. Um, he has his class schedule the way he did it. So, lesson 5. Um, let's see. 9 through 14. I'm not sure if I only went to 13. Anyway. So, let's read text 9 through 14. Because these are the texts we'll be discussing today. I'll just read, we'll read them. I'll read the translation. You can read the other one. No, it smells good. It's good to hear. It's better. Mantra 9. Those who are engaged in the culture of nescient activities shall enter into the darkest region of ignorance, where still are those engaged in the so-called culture of knowledge. The wise have explained to us that one result is derived from the culture of knowledge, and it is said that a different result is obtained from the culture of nescient. Of course, you might say, why would anyone culture nescience? Well, they don't know it's nescience. <clears throat> like drinking poison. Who would drink poison? You don't know it's poison. Only one who can learn the process of nescience and that of transcendental knowledge side by side can transcend the influence of repeated birth and death and enjoy the full blessings of immortality. It means... You have to know what ignorance is. Sometimes, you know, you, you take ignorance as knowledge, so you don't know the difference between knowledge and ignorance. Twelve. Those who are engaged in the worship of demigods enter into the darkest region of ignorance, and still more so to the worshippers of the absolute truth, the impersonal. The, the impersonalists destroy their spiritual life. Worshippers and demigods are just misguided. Thirteen. It is said that one result is obtained by worshipping the supreme cause of all causes, and that another is obtained by worshipping what is not supreme. All this was heard from the undisturbed authorities who clearly <coughs> explained it in text 14, which I didn't... read myself this morning. I was going through the purports to pick out sections that we could discuss. One should know perfectly well about the personality of Godhead and his transcendental name, as well as the temporary material creation with all its temporary demigods, men, and animals. When one knows these, he surpasses death and the ephemeral cosmic manifestation with it. And in the eternal kingdom, he enjoys his eternal life of bliss and knowledge. So let's go to verse mantra number nine. And I've picked out a lot of things to read from this purport because a lot of what is in this purport is also discussed later. So I've picked out more from this purport to discuss. One thing that came to me when I was reading this was basically two things, reading these verses. One was a condemnation of teachers who don't come into civic succession and who teach ignorance as knowledge. And Prabhupada spends a lot of time condemning them. And also the condemnation of the worshippers of the demigods. And so as I was reading this, uh, Prabhupada came up with something in, in, the purple, in one purport, and he said, because of all these t 
teachers who are not coming in disciplic succession. It makes it really difficult for the real teachers to spread their knowledge. Because as you know, being in India, people are misguided. And when we read about the destination of the demigod, demigod worshippers, it's not looking so good for them. And the destination of the impersonalist, it's not looking good for them. And what the worst destination is for those who are teaching ignorance. They suffer because they've misguided people. So Prabhupada dedicates a lot of the purport to explaining the difference between knowledge and ignorance and then talking about the misleaders who are misleading people and how harmful that is for society in general. And I was thinking on the way over here how you remember when we were discussing the first mantra and how he was saying, this mantra, if it was followed, it would solve all the ecological problems. And so as I was reading this, I was thinking, these mantras that followed would revolutionize the whole ed industry of education and solve many of the problems that people are facing. Students are facing all kinds of problems today. Basic fundamental problems that I don't think students traditionally faced because of the emphasis on uh, not any longer on character building, but just on the problem called Shilpagan, just, just getting some knowledge so you can perform a job and not character building. And so what's happening to the character, so you're learning how to, to be an engineer or a programmer, you're learning an occupation, but your character in the process is getting destroyed. Isn't it? And people say, ask me, he said, Mahatma Prabhu, what did you major in in university? And so then I, I reflect on it and said, well, the main thing I learned was how to break the regulative principles. <laughs> Basically, because that was the environment and that's what the professors were doing. And no professor, there was no class about celibacy. There was no class about sobriety. There was no class about sense control. There was no class about life purpose, uh, self-realization. So that's, these are the problems Prabhupada's pointing out in these verses. So if we look at it in that context, it becomes more interesting because most everything that we're going to read now and discuss, we more or less know. But if you put it in the context of how it relates to modern civilization and you see how if people understood these verses, it could transform the entire world. Then it becomes more exciting. As I was reading this, I was thinking, this book, Isopanishad, if you see what's in it, it's actually attacking all the ignorance that's predominating specifically Indian society. Because in the West, demigod worship is not such a big thing. Impersonalism is, but you have more bogus gurus in India than, than in America or Europe. No shortage, right? Every street corner, what did Prabhupada say? Every village, someone is advertising himself as an incarnation. So Prabhupada's exposing all this in this book. So, so as we read this, I think you'll start to realize or see how this book is very important, I think, for distribution specifically in India. So I want to discuss, uh, beginning the purport, of verse 9, and as I said, in this section I've marked more things to read than in other purports, but I think it's, it's important to start with this. Purport. The mantra offers a comparative study of vidya and avidya. Avidya, or ignorance, is undoubtedly dangerous, but vidya, or knowledge, is even more dangerous when mistaken or misguided. The mantra of Sri Ishopanishad is more applicable today than at any time in the past. Modern civilization has advanced considerably in the field of mass education, but the result is that people are more unhappy than ever before because of the stress placed on material advancement to the exclusion of the most important part of life, the spiritual aspect. That you remember in the, in the seven purposes of ISKCON, one of the purposes was to create the imbalance of values. And what did Prabhupada mean? He meant that the, the total emphasis 
is on materialism. I mean, there's virtually no emphasis on spiritualism. So there's an imbalance of values in society. So it's really the same point Prabhupada's making here. And then when I was reading this, I was thinking the ten offenses to the holy name, number nine, to instruct the faithless person. But Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, that offense also relates to the guru initiating an unqualified person, or also the guru being unqualified. So Prabhupada says, if the guru is unqualified, and the, he goes to hell and the disciple goes with him. And I was just reading that yesterday. A question was asked in a, a book by Bhakti Thakur. I forget what it was. He said, what if the guru gives you a wrong instruction? And either it's, do you think it's a wrong instruction, or it is a wrong instruction. So he said, if you think it's a wrong instruction, then of course it's your problem. But if it is a wrong instruction, you should reject that guru. Otherwise, you and the guru will both go, will both go to hell. So now look at modern, modern education. What is it doing? It's purchasing, it's, it's enabling people to go down through cultivation of ignorance. That's ultimately what it's producing. So, you know, if, if you, like Prabhupada's saying here, we've advanced in modern education. The schools are better, the facilities are better, people are more well so called educated. But Prabhupada's not looking at that, he's looking at the consequence of it. And he's saying the consequence of it is horrid. It's, it's worse than if these people didn't go to school. And I remember, I don't know if it was Prabhupada or, or someone was observing, he said that, I think Prabhupada, yeah, he said, now Prabhupada said this, you know, you know when Prabhupada began preaching, um, at that time, there was a lot of illiteracy in India, much more than there is today. And he was saying, illiteracy is good because then they're not reading all these bogus books. Isn't that funny? So, you know, we put so much emphasis on knowledge, education, literacy, and Prabhupada's saying, the illiterate people in one sense were better because they had no access to all these impersonalists and other bogus philosophies. So that's interesting. So Prabhupada's making the point. You look at education, it looks like, oh, there's more literacy and, and India's progressing economically and you're all getting better jobs. And, and what's the consequence of that? More ignorance. You have more... One person, he said something very interesting. He said, we have more knowledge, but there's more ignorance. We have more um, hospitals, and there's more disease. We have more this, but there's... You know, we have the things that are supposed to prevent the problem, but we have more of the problem. And I forget the list, but he listed about ten things. It was very, you know, we have more better education and more ignorance than ever. So that's the point Prophet's making. So, so it basically in this purport he's saying ignorance is one thing, but knowledge in the guise of ignorance is much more dangerous. And also ignorance is interesting. At least if I know it's ignorance, I'm safe. But if I think it's knowledge, then I'm in trouble. You know, I, I, I'm lost, but I know the way home is not this way. Well, that's okay. But if I think it's this way, then I'm in trouble. So there's no shortage of bogus gurus. And uh, Prabhupada will talk about them as, you know, what's the qualification of a bogus guru? One qualification is no disciplic succession. So the second paragraph. As far as Vidya is concerned, the first mantra has explained very clearly that the Lord is the proprietor of everything and that forgetfulness of this fact is ignorance. The more a man forgets this fact of life, the more he is in darkness. In view of this, a godless civilization directed toward the so-called advancement of education is more dangerous than a civilization in which the masses of people are less educated. So the, the radio, the TV comes and says, what is your solution? We say, less education would be better. Perhaps no education would even be better than bad education. You know, no medicine rather than bad medicine. Right? You know that story? It's so funny. In Europe, in Europe years ago, there was a strike in the medical profession, and all the doctors went on strike, so there were no doctors in the hospital. And that week, less people died than normal. 
in, I think I read it in that same book, We Have More Medicine and More Illness. He said there's a category of disease, you know, the different causes of disease, and one of the causes of diseases is doctors. Did you know that? By, by mistreatment, improper, uh, uh, you know, they don't analyze the disease, or they mistreat the disease, or they give medicine that's not necessary, or they require procedures that are not necessary. So that week, when the doctors weren't there, there were less deaths in the hospital. I mean, you could say it was a coincidence, or you could say it was a result of the fact that doctors sometimes uh, are creating more problems than they're curing. I mean, I, I don't want to put doctors down, but there's an interesting fact. Mm -hmm. So sometimes knowledge is dangerous, right? Of the different classes of men, karmis, gyanis, and yogis, the karmis are those engaged in activities of sense gratification. In the modern civilization, 99.9% .9 of people are engaged in activities of sense gratification. 99.9. .9. So I guess the 1.9 are the devotees. The, the zero, the, the point? Point one. Point one. Yeah. Point 0.1% are devotees, spiritualists, transcendentalists. Ninety-nine point nine percent of people are engaged in activities of sense gratification under the flags of industrialism, economic development, altruism, political activism, and so on. So this is this is funny. It's kind of funny what Prabhupada's saying. He's saying, you know, all the politicians are out there. Vote for me. I'm going to do this and that for you. And you know, I don't know about in your country, but you know who wins the elections in America? the politician who can convince people that if you elect me, the economy will be better. That's basically all they care about, because money sends gratitude. Is that true here in India as well? You know, it's very easy to get re-elected if during your term the economy was good. And it's much more difficult to get re-elected if the economy is bad. And in fact, like now, with re-elections in America, they come up in November, And so, if the economy goes down this year, it would be hard for Trump to be re-elected. Re if the economy goes up, it's pretty certain he'd be re-elected, despite, in spite of everything else. In India, religious, religion plays a major role in elections. Religion. Religion is more important, yeah. So, it was... It, it was, was more important? It was caste politics. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, but the basic, the basic premise Prabhupada is making here is that whatever the flag is, it ultimately, <coughs> if it brings more sense gratification, then it, it gets support from the people. So religion that brings sense gratification is, is desirable. I mean, why do, people, why do people go to temples? What's the ultimate purpose? Become Krishna conscious, or to become materially benefited. Oh, respect and fear. Yeah, fear. If I don't, uh, then my material life, I will suffer some bad karma, something like that. Just keep the safe and stay safe. Insurance, spiritual insurance. Ensure everything is nice. Okay. Yeah. 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 Hey, my, so it's you know, maybe it's not such a gross form of sense gratification, but it's similar. In the language of Bhagavad Gita 7.15, people who are engaged in gross sense gratification are called mudha asses. You know. Jagannashami ki jay, Sisi Radha Krishna Chandra ki jay, Nithai Chaitanya ki jay, Lakshmi Shimu ki jay, Govanamani Oh. So Prabhupada was speaking with one man, and the man was saying, "You're you're you're calling these people rascals and asses, and you know this is 
not the way a guru should speak. And Prabhupada said, I'm just repeating the Bhagavad Gita. This is what, I'm just repeating Krishna's words. I'm not saying, Krishna is saying, and I'm just saying what Krishna is saying. So Prabhupada's quoting the verse, Namam Duskriti Namudha Prabhupada Yeah, Namam Duskriti Namudha. What's the next line? Namam Duskriti What's the second line? Prabhupada Mayam Abharita Jnana Asurim Bhagavad So Krishna is saying, uh, People, the karmis, working hard for sense gratification, they don't see The ass is a symbol of stupidity. Those who simply engage in the profitless pursuit of sense gratification are worshipping avidya. So you have this vidya, you know, you use the word vidya for your schools, right? Vidya, laya, and other words, such words. You have to put an A in front of it. It's a misnomer. They're institutions of ignorance. Because the goal of that institution is to increase the student's sense gratification. Isn't that the ultimate goal? Through education you get a better job. If you get a better job, you make more money. If you make more money, then you can get more sense gratification. Isn't it? Is that the idea? Yes? This looks very interesting. The way this we have the deities here, very nice. <clears throat> it almost looks like I'm superimposed. Yeah, so. Funny, huh? Those who play the role of helping this sort of civilization in the name of educational advancement are actually doing more harm than those who are on the platform of gross sense gratification. Because they're advancing, they're, they're advancing the cause of ignorance, so they're doing harm, more harm. The advancement of learning by a godless people is as dangerous as a valuable jewel on the head of a cobra. A cobra decorated with a valuable jewel is more dangerous than one not decorated. In the Hari Bhakti Shuddhadaya, the advancement of education by a godless people is compared Two decorations on the dead body in India and in many other countries. Some follow the custom of leading a procession with a decorated dead body for the pleasure of lamenting relatives. In the same way, modern civilization is a patchwork of activities meant to cover the perpetual miseries of material existence. I mean, look how heavy Prabhupada is. Just, it's, like a, it's like a boxer just <laughs> smashing material civilization, punch after punch. All such activities are aimed towards sense gratification. But above the senses is the mind, above the mind is the intelligence, and above the intellig intelligence is the soul. Thus the aim of real education should be self-realization, realization of the spiritual values of the soul. Any education which does not lead to such realization must be considered avidya or nescience, and to culture such nescience means to go down to the darkest regions of ignorance. In other words, what Prabhupada is saying is, if you only cultivate this knowledge, your next life you're going down. Because basically, the focus of this knowledge is to increase your sense gratification, and that's all animal life is about, is sense gratification. Make sense? So basically, what Prabhupada is saying is, these educators are training up people, instead of being humans, to be animals. So, now these people they've trained, he's, he or she has ruined their life, they go down in their next life, and you, for teaching, that will go down with them as well. Then you might say, well, you know, what if someone's just a professor, who's just teaching chemistry? And is he really, are they really going to go to hell? Well. Well, I'll leave that up to Krishna. But the general, the general idea being given in this verse is that educational institutions, should, aside, alongside of giving whatever knowledge is necessary to maintain our bodies, they should give spiritual knowledge. And if they don't, 
it, it, it's going to result in what we're seeing today. And Prabhupada talks about this uh, elsewhere. I'm going to skip a little bit. One, two, and, and the third paragraph in the last, second to last sentence of, if you skip down two paragraphs, <coughs> begins, the so-called students. The so-called students of the Vedas are condemned herein because they are ignorant of the actual purpose of the Vedas on account of their disobeying the Acharyas. These are called Veda-vata-rata. Such Veda-vata-rata search out meanings in every word of the Vedas to suit, to suit their own purposes. They do not know that the Vedic literature is a collection of extraordinary books that can be understood only through this separate succession. So now, Prabhupada's getting into this this idea that knowledge, real knowledge, comes through the Sipla succession. It's not that someone makes it up. And, and you know, nowadays in India you have gurus. And you say, well, who's your guru? I don't have one. I just read some books or, you know, it was revealed to me. So, Veda Vata Rata. This is um, the reference. so-called study of the Vedas without following the Acharyas. And so they, they just speculate, and they create so many problems. One must approach a bona fide spiritual master in order to understand the transcendental message of the Vedas. That is the direction of the Mundaka Upanishad. These Veda Vata Rata people, however, have their own Acharyas, who are not in the chain of transcendental succession. Thus they progress into the darkest region of ignorance by misinterpreting the Vedic literature. They fall even further into ignorance than those who have no knowledge of the Vedas at all. Isn't that interesting? So, so you know this story that Lord Ramachandra, he once killed the Sudra because the Sudra was reading the Vedas. You know that story? So, the Vedas in the hands of the wrong people are dangerous. He said, you know, you're a Sudra, you have the Vedas. This is dangerous because you'll misinterpret and the purpose of the Vedas will be lost. And because you're a Shudra, you'll interpret everything in terms of sense gratification. So he killed him. Now look at the world today. The Vedas are in the hands of anybody. Any man on the street can get a copy. Right? And that's why Prabhupada's books are the savior because of his purpose. You know, when Prabhupada gave us the Gita, he said, you can't understand the Gita without my purpose, you have no idea. So as you can see from reading this that people have no idea without Prabhupada's purpose. Isn't it? What did we read, read yesterday? Anupashati, following, seeing, the way the Acharyas see. So Prabhupada's making the same point here. You know, if you go on YouTube, you will find many, there are many gurus, isn't it? You know this, this one guy, what's his name? Pat, he's, he's like an authority on, on, he's become very famous, authority on Ramayana Mahabharata, Patanayaka. 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 Yeah, he's like a major authority on him. And, um, and he believes Mahabharata, Ramayana, it's all mythology. But he analyzes it, like what are the messages, what are the teachings. And he's, he's an authority. So that's symptomatic of Kali Yuga, that, that religion is taken as your religion, your religion is taken as religion. So the real Acharyas, where are the real Acharyas? Where, where are they? How, how respected are they? And the bogus acharyas, so-called acharyas, they're very famous, very well known. So look at what Prabhupada says. <laughs> you know, one time Prabhupada was describing professors who were misleading people. And he said, actually, because you're misleading people, your function as a professor is not only useless, it's harmful. And it would be better if you just retired and got some land and at least grow your own food. Do something useful. Isn't that interesting? You know, 
Don't even take food from the store that other people grow. Grow your own. Do something useful for the world instead of mislead people. So, uh, yes. Last paragraph. The Maya, the Maya Aparita Jnana class of men are self-made gods. Such men think that they themselves are God and that there is no need of worshipping any other god. They will agree to worship an ordinary man if he happens to be rich, but they will never worship the personality of Godhead. Such men, unable to recognize their own foolishness, never consider how it is that God can be entrapped by, his, by Maya, his own illusory energy. If God were ever entrapped by Maya, Maya would be more powerful than God. You know, what is Prabhupada referring to? That, you know, the Maya bodies say, well, actually, I'm God, I'm just covered by illusion, and it's my Leela. It's God's Leela that we'd all be in illusion, and when you get out of illusion, you realize you're God, and Prabhupada said. So, that means illusion is more powerful than God. Because whatever is the most powerful is God. So here it seems like illusion is God. Because illusion has, has overcome God. Or like the Christians say, the devil. The devil's competing. The devil sometimes overpowers God. So if the devil overpowers God, he's God. Because the most powerful is God. But this is all like stupid philosophy. Isn't it stupid? Do you agree? And because we're fortunate to have heard from Prabhupada, we have some intelligence. Although we would also be stupid like everyone else, but Prabhupada's giving us intelligence to see through all the stupidity. So when you read these purports, one thing I think you should feel is, I'm very fortunate that I've been enlightened by Prabhupada because I was also confused and ignorant like everyone else. And now Prabhupada's setting everything clear. The Vedas in the hands of the Shudras, that's the problem. That's the problem in the world today. And then you get all these gurus propounding all kinds of crazy ideas. And the ultimate goal is what? To be peaceful, to be happy. And so that's maybe more subtle form of sense gratification, but the ultimate goal is sense gratification. Jai Prabhupada. Yes. So what's Prabhupada doing in this purport? Heavy, heavy. Didn't I, I think I told you the story the other day. Prabhupada was with a Hindu, a professor of Hinduism, and he asked him, what is Hinduism? And the professor said, that's a difficult question to answer. And Prabhupada was like, just see, he's a professor of Hinduism, and he doesn't even know what Hinduism is. And this is, this kind of cheating is going on. So then he turned to his disciple, said, he is a professor of Hinduism and he doesn't know what Hinduism is. What is that called? Prabhupada, that is called cheating. He has called you a cheater. What do you have to say for yourself? Well, Prabhupada was like that sometimes. You know, when, when he saw this cheating, he directly confirmed it. And you see, this is what I perceive from from Prabhupada's dealing with misguided educators, misleaders, Mayavad philosophers, bogus gurus, atheists, atheistic science. That very thing that Prabhupada said, it's very difficult to preach in this age because of all of this. It was really upsetting to Prabhupada. He was really he really felt that if we are going to spread Krishna consciousness in tilling the land, so to speak, picking up the weeds, we have to expose all these people because this is a huge obstacle because people believe in them. So if we're going to be able to plant the seed of Krishna consciousness, first thing is we have to show you what you've learned is all wrong. These people do not represent the disciplic succession. They have not understood things clearly. That's the picking the weeds out of the soil. Now I can give you the right knowledge, but when you've been wrongly guided, it's very difficult. And you know this from preaching in India. Yes, yes, we know all these things. You don't know anything. You know all wrong things. And you think, yes, we have our guru, we know all these things. Yeah, that's the problem. You have a guru who doesn't know all these things. 
isn't it? That's a huge obstacle. And um, I was preaching in South America and Mexico, and <coughs> South America and Mexico in many ways are like India. People are very religious, very, very religious. So if you talk about God, they're very open. And, and I was thinking, this is so much easier than preaching in India because there's no misconception. Demigods this, Mayavad this. They don't have it. They're just pious people who believe in God. And then you give them knowledge. The weeds in the field have been removed. But in India, there's so many weeds. Isn't it? That's like incredible. You know, when we have initiation, and then we're discussing the offenses, we consider the names of demigods, like Lord Shiva and Karma Kanda. It's like, for a Westerner, it's not even an issue. It never was an issue. And if it's going to be an issue, it's only because they started reading the Vedas that it would be an issue. But before they had the Vedas, they don't even know who demigod is. They don't even know what karma khanda is. It's not even an issue. So, if it's initiation with Westerners, I don't spend much time talking about that because worship. You know, we don't even know what dem what a demigod was. We just learned about Krishna. Yes. Yes. Based on education is based on the education is based on Yes. But how do we say that the people who are getting that knowledge, whatever knowledge they are gaining, they are preaching to the other people? Because they themselves are in ignorance. Yes. How can we defend that they are cheating? How can we? Defend that they are cheaters. Because they themselves are in ignorance. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So so the the reality if I if I give you directions to go somewhere and I don't know the directions are wrong. That's still bad and you're still gonna get lost. But if I know the directions are wrong and I consciously give you wrong directions because I want you to suffer, that I will suffer more. But in, in either case, there's a reaction. I had a professor, this is a true story, he was a philosophy professor. And in the first day of class, he had, he had a position in America, it's called tenure. And tenure means you can't get removed from your position. I mean, you'd have to do something horrendous to get removed. So you can basically teach the class any way you want. And the first day of class, there were 600 students in that class. And the first day of class, he said, I don't know anything. And so there's no need to come to my class. You can just write a, a term paper. That's all you need to do. So he was honest. The only honest professor I ever had. I think Prabhupada would appreciate that. That he was honest enough to know after teaching philosophy for decades, that his conclusion was, I don't know what's true. So, it's true there's less suffering involved if you're, if you're in ignorance about your ignorance, and more suffering if you're in knowledge about your ignorance. But, also we have to look at the consequence of what you're doing. So, that's also taken into consideration karmically. That I may be in ignorance, I may not know, but still, the result on the people that I'm teaching is that they will suffer in ignorance. So I have to take that karma. You know, you get married, you're a young man, you're a good husband, you take care of your wife and your kids, and you work hard, you provide for them. But you don't give them spiritual knowledge. You're going to suffer. Because it's your responsibility. Or you give them the wrong spiritual knowledge because you learned it wrongly and you think it's right. You'll also suffer. Right? Maybe not as much as if you consciously mislead somebody. Like, like you're bogus and you know you're bogus. You, you, know, you tell everybody you're God, obviously you know you're not. So you'll suffer more. If you innocently mislead people, still, you'll suffer. I think one thing we get from reading this, these purports is that we have a big responsibility. 
Yeah. Yeah, because Prabhupada is direct, uh, at least the way I read this, he's directly relating to, to what we see in the field of education. And now with, with the introduction of YouTube and Facebook, it's given a platform for more bogus people to speak. Isn't it? Before you needed, you know, some kind of branding and money and to get out there and you couldn't get out as broadly as you can get out now. Now, <coughs> there's so many wrong ideas. And even another interesting thing is I was watching one, <coughs> one man, I think he's a German man or European man, who's studied, he studied Eastern philosophy and he was giving a, doing a little online course on karma. And he was explaining karma quite well. But he wasn't a bhakta, so where does it lead? Okay, I explain how karma works. You do this, you get this reaction, and so forth. But where does it lead? Okay, you have that knowledge, but there's no introduction, introduction of God and bhakti. So, so you have this partial knowledge problem. You know, people giving partial knowledge. leaving them hanging. And the problem with partial knowledge is it makes people think that they have knowledge and they don't need any more. Oh, I have knowledge. My guru taught me this. But he left you hanging. He didn't come to the Siddhanta, but you think he did. And now you're not searching for it. So that's a problem. We're finding this in America now. Lots of people are into yoga and Eastern philosophy. And the problem is they think they understand it. And so often it's very difficult to to preach to them. It's, it's easier to preach to people who know nothing. Right? What did, what did um, Prabhupada Nanda Saraswati said? He said, My dear sir, with a straw in my mouth, I'm humbly approaching you. You're very learned. You're very advanced. I have one request. Forget everything you know. And just take the mercy of Mahaprabhu. Because until you forget everything you know, it's very difficult to preach to you. Yes, Prashna Sindhu. Yes, um, you know, when Prabhupada the during Prabhupada's time, the literacy was more and life was better. And during Prabhupada's time? During Prabhupada's time, illiteracy was more. What was more? Illiteracy. 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 I thought you said electricity. No, electricity was less. Illiteracy was more, but electricity yeah. was less. So life was better. So then, um, is it even required to have medical education? Yeah, well, that comes up in the other verse. You need material knowledge sufficient, sufficiently to maintain yourself. I think we've gone overboard with material knowledge. You know when Vishwakarma offered Arjuna, it was Maya, excuse me, Maya Dhanava, Arjuna saved Maya Dhanava from a forest fire, and so he said, okay, well, I'll bless you with knowledge, and Krishna said, don't get technical knowledge because it'll ruin everything. Do you know that story? Krishna said, Arjuna, don't take, he can give you knowledge of technology, don't take it, it will destroy everything. And so it's kind of funny in light of the fact that everywhere you go in India, every college is a technological school. Do you have any schools of philosophy left? Very few, right? Seems like, every, I don't know, but it seems like everywhere I go, it's always technologies in the title of the university. The system is the whole country is revolving on the economy. But the yeah. government is worried about the money. Economy. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And the, well, the whole city education is designed for the economy. Yeah, exactly. They make it a professional so that they do business and they work and then create. Okay, it, and right. the problem is it's designed to help the economy. But look at your cities. These are some of the most horrible cities I've ever seen. You know, huge, huge. Huge, 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 huge. There's a problem called anthills. He called flats anthills. They're just big piled up on top of one another. Um, I mean, you all know this better than I do. The pollution, the, the difficulties. And, and so that's what we've, economic development has created that. And so the more you have economic development, it seems the bigger the cities are going to get. Then you have Mumbai, then you have Navi, Navi Mumbai, because Mumbai is too small. You need a bigger Mumbai. 
and you have Delhi, which is like a whole country in itself. And I think uh, Benares has the most polluted air in the world. That's what I read. If not number one, at least it's in the top three. So, that's the result of advancement of knowledge. You've learned how to pollute the cities, you've polluted the Jamuna, the Ganga, congratulations. This is your advancement of knowledge. So, uh, Prabhupada points, you know, Prabhupada makes this sarcastic thing. Advancement of knowledge, look at the consequence. Are we better off today than we were 100 years ago? 200, 500? You know, you could, if you're comparing India to America, you might say yes. But, what did the British do to help India? They destroyed the Gurukuls, right? That's one of the... You know, they wanted to destroy the culture, so they destroyed the Gurukulas. So instead of Gurukulas, we have this University of Technology and that one. So let's look at the result. Stress. And it's just beginning. The, the, the problems are just beginning. Stress, pollution. Uh, I mean, you all know the problems, so anyway. Prabhupada always uses the word so-called advancement. It looks like advancement, but when you actually analyze it. Are people happier? Not necessarily. They're definitely more stressed. And stress is one of the major causes of immune dysfunction. So you get sicker when you're stressed. Main stress from the survival of the fittest. The survival of the fittest, that's the main yeah. stress. Yeah. Um, you know what's happening also in the world in the name of advancement. Our food, we're depleting the earth we grow the food on, in, on. And therefore, we're all vitamin deficient because the food is not supplying the nutrients we need. Think about that. That is a result of advancement of education that our food can't actually supply the nutrients we need. Otherwise, why are there so many vitamins, minerals, supplements? Mm -hmm. And not only that, the food contains poison. There's poison on it in the form of pesticides. So it doesn't provide all the minerals. We use a lot of energy to digest it, and we don't get all the energy back. And it contains pesticides, which are poisons, which are cancers. That's one of the aspects of advancement of knowledge. So if you if you actually look at the consequence of what's going on in modern society, you go down. <coughs> Advancement of knowledge produces A, B, C, D, E, F. Then it looks like a bad deal, according to me. It doesn't look like advancement of knowledge. It looks like advancement of ignorance, from my perspective. You get to live in a city where the air is killing you, where the air is, is shortening the duration of your life. And that's the advancement of knowledge. No, but we have air conditioning in our house. Fantastic. You'll die in a cool house ten years earlier than you should have died because the air has killed you. I mean, you can't even take the water from your rivers because they're contaminated. You have to wear a mask when you go outside because the air is contaminated. What kind of advancement of knowledge is that? And then you're all writing software for companies who are destroying the planet by producing whatever it is they produce, or cheating people in some way. Hare Krishna. Doesn't sound like a good plan to me. What do you think? Am I exaggerating? Or am I <coughs> under-exaggerating? I mean, that's the way we have to look at it. That's the concept. We have to look at the consequences of the advancement of knowledge. Are the people realizing now and slowly peeling back? In the West, ever since the time of the hippies, the hippie movement was a revolution against all of this. <coughs> but it, didn't, it wasn't guided by the proper guru. But people people are getting glimpses of the reality, it's hard not to see it. I think you have to embrace ignorance not to see it. You know, to go to work every day, 
and work eight, ten hours a day to get enough money to pay your bills and not think about what am I doing with my life? That's, that's a lot of ignorance. Isn't it? Yes? So, in, let's read text 10. This is interesting. Because here Prabhupada describes knowledge and then it just makes it makes what we've just talked about even more clear because Prabhupada here is describing what knowledge is. And it's not what people in general describe as knowledge. People describe knowledge as facts and figures, theories, equations, data, historical information. Google. Google is a source of knowledge. So here Prabhupada describes knowledge. So this is text 10. The wise have explained one result is derived from the culture of knowledge and a different result is obtained from the culture of nations. So, as advised in chapter 13 of Bhagavad Gita, verses 8 through 12, one should culture knowledge in the following way. So, I'm just going to read these. This is, and we can kind of reflect on, reflect on the educational system, reflect on your education, and if you learned any of these things when you went to school. One should become a perfect gentleman and learn to give proper respect to others. One should not pose himself as a religionist simply for name and fame. One should not become a source of anxiety to others by the actions of his body, by his thoughts, of his mind, or by his words, and that includes animals. So, your teacher should have taught you to be vegetarian. One should learn forbearance even in the face of provocation from others. One should learn to avoid duplicity in his dealings with others. That means one shouldn't lie. One should be honest. One should search out... Uh, that's uh, a big problem, right? In modern society, honesty. One should search out a bona fide spiritual master who can lead him gradually to the stage of spiritual realization. And one must submit himself to a spiritual master. Did any of you learn in school that you should take shelter of a spiritual master? Was that part of your curriculum? Anybody learn that? That's the first thing you should learn. To be humble. I mean, Guru Kula, Guru Kula, is that where you go? That's where you go to submit to your spiritual master. Guru Kula is the place where you learn everything you need to learn to be a civilized human being and a com a competent to contribute to society. Isn't that funny? We didn't hear, hear anything about <coughs> gurus. One must be fixed. Uh, in order to approach the platform of self-realization, one must follow the regular principles enjoined in the revealed scriptures. One must be fixed in the tenets of the revealed scriptures. One should completely refrain from practices which are detrimental to the interest of self-realization. One should not accept more than he requires for maintenance of the body. So we had discussed this in the first verse extensively, how we're all, we all are uh, mad to acquire more than we need. That's kind of like normal today. One should not falsely identify himself with the gross material body, nor should one consider those who are related to his body to be his own. One should always remember that as long as he has a material body, he must face the miseries of repeated birth, old age, disease, and death. There is no use making plans to get rid of these miseries of the material body. The best course is to find out the means by which one may regain his spiritual identity. This is interesting because one of the goals of modern education is to eliminate the miseries of material existence, ultimately to eliminate death. That would be the great hope of science, right? As far as cure all disease, make our life comfortable as far as possible. Isn't it? Talking about the goal of science or technology, make life more comfortable. A new app, you know, you can cook from your office or turn on your microwave. You lock your door, it'll open it for you, lock your car. Hey, life is easy, it's comfortable. There's the advancement of technology, what's it used for? Making life comfortable. 
ultimately conquering death. So what is Prabhupada saying here? Don't waste your time trying to conquer death through technology, but learn how to conquer death through spirituality. Right? Thirteen, one should not be attached to more than the necessities of life required for spiritual advancement. Fourteen, one should not be more attached to wife, children, and home than the revealed scriptures ordain. Fifteen, one should not be happy or distressed over desirables and undesirables, knowing that such feelings are just created by the mind. Sixteen, one should become an unalloyed devotee of the personality of Godhead Sri Krishna and serve him with rapt attention. I wish I would have learned all this when I went to school. How about you? My life would have been much different. One should develop a liking for residence in a secluded place with a calm and quiet atmosphere, favorable <coughs> for spiritual culture, and one should avoid Avoid congested places where non-devotees congregate. Well, we're all going to have to move out of Bangalore <laughs> tomorrow. We're going to follow this one. Once you become a scientist or philosopher and conduct research into spiritual knowledge, recognizing that spiritual knowledge is permanent, whereas material knowledge ends with the death of the body. <clears throat> So, I just wanted to read a, a few more things in this purport. Unless anyone has any questions or comments. All right, I'll ask you a question. Which one is your favorite out of the 18? Which one do you like the most? 16? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Once you become an unalloyed devotee of Krishna. I was thinking, I was thinking when I was reading this, you know, we have an epidemic, not the corona. We have a pandemic, aside from the corona. It's the pandemic of illicit sex. Because of the, you know, 80% of the websites on the internet are pornographic. Did you know that? That's what, it's, uh, it's insane. So, and it's, it, I think it's one of the hugest paradoxes that our society faces, because brahmachari means student. And of course, we, we translate brahmachari not literally as one who is acting according to spirit, but more as one who is a celibate student. Of course, celibate student traditionally means he's being educated spiritually. How many brahmacharis are there in the university? Are there any? What are, the, what are these young men learning? Isn't, that inter isn't it interesting? The brahmachari is the, is, is, the, is the name of a student. And how many brahmacharis are there being trained in your country? or any country. You know what's going on in the university, right? Like Sureshwar told me, when he went to school, he never spoke to a woman. Even though there were women in his class, they never spoke. And, they, and what, like for four years, the same class, the same students, and never spoke to a woman. Now, if you go to school, you don't speak to a woman, people will think, like, you must be gay or something. <laughs> right? Isn't it? Isn't this the, uh, the paradox of paradoxes? That student life actually meant, means to be trained as brahmachari, to be celibate? <clears throat> and actually now you're, people are being trained and supported to not be celibate by the culture, and especially by Bollywood. Okay? Bollywood's come a long way in the last 20 years. It's having a major impact on the minds and hearts of our younger generation. And because of this, it's, the, it's going to be the very cause of breaking the fidelity of men and women when they're married. Because once, once you're exposed to sex before you're married, it's very difficult to remain chaste to one man and one woman. 
Now, you haven't evolved that far in your country, but you will get there. And the average boy or girl, before they're married in the West, has had many boyfriends and girlfriends. So if you've had many, when you get married, it's difficult to stay with one, because you're not used to being with one. You're used to having a new one every year or two. And pornography is highly destructive to the chastity of the mind, because pornography is, all pornography is, it's um, fantasize, it's a fantasy world in which one is fantasizing, enjoying the opposite sex. And so whether you do it physically or do it in your mind, it has the same problem. It undermines the chastity that you need when you're married. Do you know that athletes oftentimes practice in their mind? Did you know that? They don't actually have to practice physically with their body. You can practice in your mind. Did you know that? You, if, you, if you watch somebody do something and you imagine doing it yourself, the first time you do it, it's like you've already done it. You've already practiced in your mind. So engaging in an activity in your mind, it produces those same samskaras as if you actually do it. Like we say, Oh Prabhu, but in Kali Yuga, if you think a bad thought, it, you don't get a sinful reaction. Okay, you won't get a sinful reaction, but you'll get the samskar. The habit to do that, you'll get it. It's the same as if you did it. Okay, you won't get the sinful reaction. Congratulations. You'll get everything else bad about it. <laughs> yeah. So, when I was reading this, I thought, what an irony. You know, we don't learn any of these things, and we have these very amazingly so-called advanced schools. So I'm going to go down and read from the bottom of the next paragraph. By advancement of material knowledge, modern man is simply being converted into an ass. Wow! Could you imagine saying that in a lecture with 10,000 people? at a university, at IIT. You're all being converted into asses. Heavy. The guru is heavy, but it's true. I may not recommend saying that at your next lecture at the university, but it's true. <clears throat> Some materialistic politicians in spiritual guise decry the present system of civilization as satanic. But unfortunately, they do not care about the culture of real knowledge as described in the Gita. Thus, they cannot change satanic situation. Only someone who follows Vedic principles and who knows the Siddhanta can, can change the situation. And that's you. I'm looking at you. You are the ones. You are the hope. You are the hope for the future of your country. Because there are very few people outside Gaudiya Vaishnavism, or Vaishnavism in general, that's really going to make a difference. And if you sit on the sidelines and watch everything go to hell, then you're responsible for it. They have two things, sin, sin of commission and the sin of omission. So it's sinful to do something wrong, and it's sinful to not do the right thing to save a situation. So that's called the sin of omission. You didn't do anything when you could have done something. So we can't sit and, with, with the knowledge Prabhupada's giving us, comes the responsibility to disseminate it. Right? You agree? So listen to this. This next one is kind of funny. So Prabhupada, is, he's kind of basing his purport off these items of knowledge and showing how in modern civilization, because we're not trained this way, we act pretty much in a contrary way. In modern society, even a boy thinks himself self-sufficient and pays no respect to elderly men. Due to the wrong type of education being imparted in our universities, boys all over the world are giving elders headaches. Isn't that funny? And maybe Prabhupada's speaking from personal experience. What is Prabhupada saying? Is that these young boys think they know everything? and they're disrespecting their elders. And respect for elders is one of the items of knowledge. 
Esau Upanishad very strongly warns that the culture of nations is different than that of the culture of knowledge. The universities are, so to speak, centers of nations only. Wow! Your university is a center of nations and you're all being trained to be asses. Hare Krishna. University students today are not given instructions in the regulative principles of brahmacharya, celibate student life, nor do they have any faith in any scriptural injunctions. Religious principles are taught for the sake of name and fame only and not for the sake of practical action. Thus, there is animosity not only in social and political fields, but in the field of religion as well. So here, Prabhupada is blaming, you could say blaming, those whose responsibility it is to give spiritual knowledge for all these problems. Because, because there are no real Brahmins, the educational system has become corrupt, as a result there's all these problems. So yes, we're more educated and there's more problems. We have more education and we have more problems. Isn't that interesting? Nationalism has developed in different parts of the world due to cultivation of nations by the general people. No one considers that this tiny earth is just a lump of matter floating in immeasurable space along with many other lumps. In comparison to the vastness of space, these material lumps are like dust particles in the air. Because God has kindly made these lumps of matter complete in themselves, they are perfectly equipped with all necessities for floating in space. The drivers of our spaceships may be very proud of their achievements, but they do not consider the supreme driver of these greater, more gigantic spaceships called planets. What's Prabhupada saying? We're glorifying the scientists. Jagannath Swami Ki We're glorifying the scientists for their spaceships, but we're not glorifying the Supreme Lord, who can float the innumerable planets in space. The Prabhupada gives this example that some comedian on stage, he's imitating an animal and it's barking. And he gets, he gets the barking perfectly. Everyone's laughing and applauding. I said, but, but why don't you applaud the dog? You applaud the man who imitates the dog. There's someone's painting, a beautiful painting of a flower. Why don't you glorify the person who made the flower rather than the person who painted the flower? So that's the, the defect of modern civilization. It's like God is just like, he's behind the curtain. Nobody's interested. So, uh, this is a long purport. One more thing I wanted to read in this purport. Two more things. <coughs> and if we go to the next paragraph, the fourth sentence. Thanks to the culture of Nessians, <coughs> Befooled men have created their own nations within these planets in order to grasp <coughs> sense enjoyment more effectively for these few years. Such foolish people draw up various plans to render national demarcations perfectly, a task that is totally impossible. Yet for this purpose, each and every nation has become a source of anxiety for others. Like, like when Prabhupada would come and there'd be visa immigration. What would Prabhupada say? He said, you know, just like when you walk down the street and there's a dog in someone's home and you walk by, they start barking. Because dogs are like security guards. They're natural security guards. Don't trespass my master's property. So Prabhupada, when you would go to immigration and they'd say, you can't come in, he would say, it's just like a dog barking. He said, why can't I come in? I'm God's representative. This country is God's country. All land is God's country. You've artificially drawn some border. How can, you, how can you stop me from coming in? That's what Prabhupada's talking about. Here. And then he said that's creating anxiety because we're fighting over these boundaries. More than 50% of a nation's energy is devoted to defense measures and thus spoiled. No one cares for the cultivation of real knowledge, yet people are falsely proud of being advanced in both material and spiritual knowledge. Yeah, we're advanced, we have nuclear weapons. I think that is the epitome of the paradox of advancement. We've created enough weapons that we could destroy the world. How many, anybody know how many times could we destroy the world with the amount of weapons we have? Does anybody know? Maybe like 10 times over or something? 
Yes, I'm reading from this Upanishad. Anyway, some figure that with the, with the nuclear weapons we have, we could just destroy the entire planet multiple times. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is the result of our advancement of knowledge. Isn't that interesting? What do you think? We've learned how to kill ourselves faster than ever. That's the result of our knowledge. Okay. So we've done 9 and 10. Now, 11. One who can learn the process of nescience and that of transcendental knowledge side by side can transcend the influence of repeated birth and death and enjoy the full blessings of immortality. So, when Prabhupada says cultivating avidya, he means cultivating material knowledge. In the very first line, he says something interesting. Since the creation of the material world, everyone has been trying to attain a permanent life, but the laws of nature are so cruel that no one has been able to avoid the hand of death. So, in this sense, cultivating knowledge of ignorance would mean understanding that you can't live permanently in this world. That would be a, a culture of, of nation, so to speak. At least understanding the difference between matter and spirit. So that's one understanding of this verse. That you, you understand matter, you understand its limitations. Because they're trying, to, they're trying and hoping that someday we can make matter eternal. Or more, or at least at least try to, to do things that matter, which may be impossible to do. So by understanding the nature of avidya, or the nature of the matter, then we won't do things which would waste our time. The other, other point that Prabhupada makes, a simple point, is that, um, well, let's read. Just read a few things. We go down to second, third, fourth paragraph. The whole point here is that even Hiranyakashipu, the most powerful of materialists, could not become deathless by his various plans. What then can be accomplished by the tiny Hiranyakashipus of today, whose plans are thwarted from moment to moment? So understanding the nature of matter just means that, that you don't strive to become deathless. You're wasting time. And that energy could be put into self-realization. The next paragraph. Isopanishad instructs us not to make one-sided attempts to win the struggle for existence. Everyone is struggling hard for existence, but the laws of material nature are so hard and fast that they do not allow anyone to surpass them. In order to attain a permanent life, one must be prepared to go back to God. So Prabhupada makes the point, uh, the sad point, but it's a little funny also, that, that while you're making plans to live forever, you die in the process. So while you're discovering the cure for this or that, you're getting older and older, and in the process, you die. Or you're making money to get the best doctors, and in the process, you die. So that's one aspect of understanding avidya. And to go down, uh, go down to the paragraph that begins therefore the culture of Vidya. And then I go to the bottom of that. And this is funny. The modern trend of material civilization is to increase the temperature of the feverish material condition which has reached the point of 107 degrees in the form of atomic energy. So he compares, he compares society, a normal society to 98.6 in our materialistic society we've increased the fever, the fever of materialism, and now we have atomic bombs. The foolish politicians are crying that at any moment the world may go to hell. That is a result of the advancement of material knowledge and the neglect of the most important part of life, the culture of spiritual knowledge. Esau Upanishad warns that we must follow, not follow, the dangerous path leading to death. On the contrary, we must develop the culture of spiritual knowledge. Okay, so here's the other point. The next paragraph describes the other point of what it means, culture of nations, or understanding the difference between material and spiritual knowledge. This does not mean that all activities for the maintenance of the body should be stopped. 
There's no question of stopping activities, just as there is no question of wiping out one's temperature altogether when trying to recover from a disease. To make the best use of a bad bargain is the appropriate expression. The culture of spiritual knowledge necessitates the help of the body and mind. Therefore, maintenance of the body and mind is required if we are to reach our goal. So that means there has to be knowledge of how to maintain the body, which in this context is, re is referred to material knowledge, or avidya. The normal temperature should be maintained at 98.6, and the great sages and saints of India have attempted to do this by a balanced program of spiritual and material knowledge. They never allow the misuse of human intelligence for disease sensory education. So Prabhupada's making a simple point, material knowledge to maintain a healthy life so that you can engage in spiritual life. Okay, so now... Um, it's time to drink. Okay, we're going to go to 12. And now 12 talks about demigod worshippers and impersonal. Just to make sure my brain can work for two hours. I have to drink a lot of water. Text 12, those who are engaged in the worship of demigods enter into darkest regions of ignorance, and still more so do the worshipers of the impersonal absolute. So this, this goes back to the other thing, so it's better you're just in ignorance rather than cultivating impersonal understanding of God. Isn't that interesting? If you have the choice between a, being an impersonalist, a mayavadi, and a demigod worshiper, be a demigod worshiper. But that's not as bad. That's what this verse is saying. To deny the existence of Krishna and impersonalize Krishna is, is more offensive and produces a worse result than just worshiping the demigods. So I'll read a few things from this purport. I, not much. This is Third paragraph. Many philosophers and great rishis or mystics try to distinguish the absolute truth from the relative by their tiny brain power. This can only help them reach the negative conception of the absolute without realizing any positive traits. God is not this, God is not this, God is not this. This is what, what you'll understand through speculation of what Krishna isn't. You won't understand what he is. Definition of the absolute by negation is not complete. Such negative definitions lead one to create a concept of one's own. Thus one imagines that the absolute must be formless. So Prabhupada's saying, if you're going to speculate on the nature of God, then you're going to think he's not this, not this, not this, and then the logical conclusion from the material perspective is he has no form. That's spiritual. He's un now he's unlimited, he has no form. That's material logic. Like we said yesterday, if he has form, he's limited. So that's material logic. Such negative qualities are simply the reversals of relative material qualities and are therefore also relative. By conceiving of the absolute in this way, one can at the utmost reach the impersonal effulgence of God, known as Brahman. But one cannot make further progress to Bhagavan, the personality of God. So, we can say impersonalism is a logical conclusion of the limited mind. That's what the limited mind will conclude. God has no form, he's not material. No eyes, no hands, no legs. 
Next paragraph. In Bhagavad Gita 720, it is said that only unintelligent, bewildered persons driven by a strong desire for sense gratification worship the demigods for the temporary relief of temporary problems. Wow, that's kind of heavy. So many people worship demigods, right? So, what's wrong with that? I worship the demigods. What's wrong with that? Bhagavad Gita says, you're unintelligent. You're bewildered. That's what's wrong. Let's go to the next paragraph. It's stated in Bhagavad Gita 723 that the worshippers of the demigods can go to the planets of the demigods. The moon worshippers can go to the moon, the sun worshippers to the sun. So Prabhupada sometimes gives the example, and this is it's so simple, but it's so profound. You're worshipping a demigod, right? Yanti Deva Bhattade Yanti Yanti You're going to go to the person you worship. That's where you're going to go. And you're doing the exact same thing to worship this god. You're doing the puja. You're offering your prayers. You're offering your banana and incense. You're doing it all. And you could do it to Krishna and go back to him. But you do it to a demigod, and you do the same effort when you go to a demigod in the material world. That's called less intelligent, isn't it? It's like, well, Prabhu, here's an investment. This investment you get 2%. This investment you get 6%. This investment you get 1,008%. Which investment? Oh, I'll, I'll take the one that gives 1%. That's called stupid. This investment you'll get okay, you'll get some good karma, and you can be born as a demigod. And then you'll come back down and suffer again, another material body. And this investment, you go back to God here. Which is a better investment? Simple equation. Right? So we go down, one, two, three paragraphs down. The problems of life cannot be solved simply by going to the moon or some other planet above or below it. Therefore, Sri Sopanishad advises us not to bother with any destination within the dark material universe, but try to get out of it, reach the effulgent kingdom of God. That's the problem. The people don't want to get out of it, they just want to create good karma. Isn't it? So, <laughs> I once had this discussion with this man who was doing a program, so I was explaining all this, and he said, but you know, I have a good life, I'm happy here, and I'm creating good karma, so my next life will be good. So why do I have to go back to Godhead? And I was explaining different reasons, and, and nothing was making sense to him. Then I finally said, because Krishna wants you to. And that made complete sense to him. Because Krishna is waiting for you, and Krishna wants you to, and he doesn't want you to stay here. And the man said, that makes sense. But otherwise, he had no reason, because his life was good. Why do I need to go back to Krishna? My life's good here. What's the reason? Krishna wants you to. That's the reason. Why did Krishna speak Bhagavad Gita? Bhagavad Gita is an invitation. That's the way I see Bhagavad Gita. It's an inv invitation to go back to God. Excuse me, sir. I have an invitation for you. It's called Bhagavad Gita. God is inviting you to go back to his kingdom. A long time ago, you left his kingdom. Here's an invitation back. No, I'm not interested. You're not interested in an invitation to go back to God? No, no, I'm happy. It's fine here. I don't need, I don't need to go there. That's the disease. That's called less intelligent. Right? Yes? So we have that less intelligence within us also. So we have to cultivate it. Because sometimes when we're happy, we think, well, everything's fine. I can be Krishna conscious. The next life, the next life. You know, as long as I get my chapatis, everything's good. Get my rants done, get my chapatis, the cores, a little halibut, everything's nice. That's a disease. <clears throat> so then Prabhupada talks about pseudo-religionists and they say, they're just using religion to maintain their position economically and get some prestige in society. So that's, that's very, very sinful. Right? You remember the story of Bhaktivinoda Thakur and that Vivekshena who was, who was imitating 
God, and he came and he challenged him and he arrested him. That's what the government should be doing with all these bogus religious people. They should be arrested. Isn't it? Is it Bhakti Vinod Thakur? You know, you have so many incarnations in every, every street. Actually, they did this in um, Arissa. I went to Arissa, maybe it was five years ago, and at that time, the government, I don't know if you know this, they cracked down on bogus gurus, and all these bogus gurus were fleeing Arissa because they were afraid they would get arrested. Did you know that? That's what the government is supposed to do, crack down on bogus religions who are using religion for sense gratification. You have a few here in Bangalore, right? Yeah, there's one from the... Nityananda? Okay. But he came back. Yeah, because foolish people... He left the country and came back again. Foolish people trust him. You know, they believe him. This is... You know, if you talk well, I mean, look at what Hitler did. You know, you can convince anybody of anything. So, yeah, so that Prabhupada's condemning them here. The atheists uh, deny the existence of God. The impersonalists support the atheist by stressing the impersonal aspect. Thus far, we have not come across any mantra in Isopanishad in which the, in which the personality of God is denied. So this is really interesting. Because Prabhupada's making the point, the Upanishad, especially Isopanishad, is describing the personal form of God. And in spite of that, you have hundreds of thousands of impersonal gurus teaching impersonalism, even though it's directly stated here. And we know human psychology is such that if you want to believe something, no matter what anybody says, you'll interpret it to support your argument. Do you know that? It's actually studied by psychologists that if you believe something, everything you hear will be interpreted within the context, within a context to support that belief, even if it doesn't support it. And because, so sometimes we wonder, how is it that there are impersonalists, so many impersonalists in India, when Krishna's words are so direct in Bhagavad Gita? I am the source of Brahman. If you believe I've come from Brahman, you're less intelligent than other verses. And then here also you suffer Because if you're attached to believing that, that's what you believe. It doesn't matter what any Shastra says. <clears throat> the ignorant pseudo-religionists and the manufacturers of so-called incarnations who directly violate the Vedic injunctions are liable to enter into the darkest region of the universe because they mislead those who follow them. So this is one of the greatest sins anyone can commit is to mislead people spiritually. These impersonalists generally pose themselves as incarnations of God to foolish persons who have no knowledge. If such foolish men have any knowledge at all, it is more dangerous in their hands than ignorance itself. It's better you just don't know anything, better be an atheist than promote some false idea. But atheism in a sense is safer because you're not necessarily being misled on the wrong spiritual path, it's just there's nothing. In a sense, it's safer. We, you know, we had the opportunity to preach for the last three years in China, and the majority of devotees becoming devotees are Buddhists, and Buddhists don't believe in God. And I discovered that it's easier to preach to Buddhists than it is to pe preach to Christians, people who, or people who have religion, because people who have religion are attached to their religious ideas. Or they have misconceptions. Where the Buddhists, they don't know anything about God. So when you talk about God, it's actually the first time they ever heard about it. Or, or how many Chinese people are atheists. So in a sense, I don't know about, I can't say about the rest of the world, but in China, the best customers are the Buddhists and the atheists. Jai Dharma, uh, calls them as unguided and misguided. Unguided are better than misguided. Unguided are better than misguided. Yeah, I agree. And so that's my experience. That when I'm preaching in China, and these people are coming, and I say, so you ever heard about God? They say, no, what's God? No idea of God in the world. And so I'm the, I'm the first one teaching them about God, which is, which is better than having them taught the wrong thing, and I have to convince them they've been taught wrongly. This is much easier. Very interesting. Isn't that interesting? Because I a clean slate. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. mm. So, now 
Prabhupada's going into the purport here. He's, now he's talking about where knowledge comes from. So we go to the second last paragraph. <clears throat> they ignore the Vedic injunction, Acharya Pasana. This is the bottom, second to last paragraph on the bottom. One must worship the Acharya. In Krishna's statement in Bhagavad Gita, Evam Puram Pura Praptam. Supreme science of God is received through disciplic succession. Instead, to mislead the people in general, they themselves become so-called acharyas, but they do not even follow the principle of the acharyas. So, how do you know who is a bona fide guru? Ask him who his guru is. And he says, I have no guru. Well, I've got some other bogus guru who's not in any bona fide mind. Then you know. Uh, you go to the doctor. How do you know he's bona fide? He's got a diploma from a recognized university. Where did you study? I didn't study. It just revealed to me. But I can do triple bypass heart surgery. Are you ready? No, I don't think so. They're going to ask Shami Kijin. I'd rather go to the surgeon who was trained at Harvard Medical School than the one who was all revealed to, who, who didn't study. Or no, where did you study? I just bought some medical books I studied. I'm ready to do the heart surgery. No, I don't think you'll do it. Same principle. The rogues are the most dangerous elements in human society. Because there is no... Re these rogues... Wow, this is a heavy statement. These rogues are the most dangerous element in human society. It's like... It's like... One thing is, is to, to preach or speak some political philosophy. But spiritual philosophy, spoken wrongly, is the most dangerous because it destroys you, you spiritually. Because there's... No, I'll read it again. These rogues are the most dangerous elements in human society. Because there is no religious government, they escape punishment by the law of the state. They cannot, however, escape the law of the Supreme who has clearly declared in the Bhagavad Gita that envious demons in the garb of religious propagandists shall be thrown into the darkest region of hell. Bhagavad Gita 16, 9 through 20. Sri Yusupanishad confirms that these pseudo-religionists are heading toward the most obnoxious place in the universe after the completion of their spiritual master business, which they conduct simply for sense gratification. Now that I was reading this, I was thinking, you know, this is medicine. Prabhupada's giving medicine. And the medicine is very heavy. Maybe bitter for some people to hear. But when I was reading this, I was thinking, the people in your country need to hear this. Do you agree? Will they accept it? <laughs> that is our, our job to get them to accept it, but they need to hear this. The Prabhupada is very, very heavy. So now... Do you have any questions on this? Um, yes, Prashna Sindhu. Because they're catering, it's like it's like uh, get some get some popular book that everybody likes. You know. Like that popular series, what is that series? <clears throat> they made all those movies from Harry Potter. Harry Potter, yeah. So you know, you go on the street, sell some Harry Potter books. You'll sell more than Barter Reviews. <laughs> so they're catering into the material sentiments of people. So naturally, they'll be more popular. You know. I mean, if you just preach what I preached, I don't know if you'd be that popular. If you just preach what's in these purports, I don't know how popular you would be. <laughs> but if you preach, you know, lovey-dovey, this and that, you're all great, you're all wonderful, do whatever you want, just give me your money. Yeah, that will go farther. So. That's part of the problem. Now, the next verse, the demigod worshippers are going to get smashed. 
So this is verse 13. It is said one result is obtained by worshiping the supreme cause of all causes, and that another result is obtained by worshiping what is not supreme. All this is heard from the undisturbed authorities who clearly explained it. So now, iti shushuma dhiranam vinas tadna vinas chakshas, iti shushuma dhiranam yenas tadna chakshas. So now, Prabhupada's is emphasizing this line of the verse. Who, who are we learning from? Who are we repeating? Where do we get this knowledge? These are persons who are qualified to speak. These are the sadhus, enlightened souls, pure souls. So Prabhupada says, the system of hearing from undisturbed authorities is approved by this mantra. So itish. Thus we have heard these things. It's not, we're, make, we're not making this up. And this is not coming from some politician or some professor in a new theory. He said, we've heard this. This is eternal transcendental knowledge revealed through the hearts of enlightened people. In Bhagavad Gita 925, it's clearly said, those who worship the Petris or forefathers attain the plans of the forefathers. And the gross materialists who make plans to remain here stay in the world and let the devotees of the Lord who worship Lord Krishna, the supreme cause of all causes, to reach him in the spiritual sky. So now, you know the problem in your country, Yatamat Tatapat. It's Bengali, right? Yatamat, whatever your opinion, Tatapat. Oh, so many opinions, so many paths. This, this philosophy, well, so many opinions, so many paths, it all leads to the same thing. That is the stupidest thing I have ever heard in my life. Whatever you believe leads to the same thing. What could be more stupid than that? But a big respected Swami Guru said it, and we think, oh, that is beautiful. However you feel, however you think, it all leads you to the same unmanifest oneness, nothingness. It's all, it's all stupid. It doesn't mean anything. So Prabhupada, listen to what Prophet says. Nowhere in, in authentic scriptures is it said that one will ultimately reach the same goal by doing anything or worshiping anyone. We are worshiping all the God. It is all good. No, it's not. There is a difference. Such foolish theories are offered by self-made spiritual masters who have no connection with the parampara, the bona fide system of discipline succession. It's right there in the Gita. You worship demigods, that's where you go. You worship the Petris, that's where you go. You worship Krishna, that's where you go. What, what's your problem? Why do you think that any kind of worship is okay? Does it make sense, does it? Going down uh, one, two paragraphs down. When Lord Krishna was present on this earth, the bhakti, bhakti yoga principles defined in the Gita had become distorted. Therefore, the Lord had to re-establish re the disciplic system, beginning with Arjuna, who was the most confidential friend. The Lord told Arjuna that it was because Arjuna was his devotee and friend that he could understand the Gita. In other words, the Lord's devotee and friend can understand the Gita. This is also the means, this, this also means that only one who follows the path of Arjuna can understand the Gita. So now, so Prabhupada's developing this theme of hearing from authority, and then he's saying, okay, what's the qualification to hear? You can't doubt the authority, you can't be envious of authority, you have to be submissive. What I find so amazing, and it's not only true in India, People don't understand their own religion. They understand what they want to understand. And whatever, you know, and then the preachers, they start preaching what people want to hear, not what they should hear. And so they become popular. And that answers your question. Why are they popular? Because they're preaching what people want to hear, not what they should hear. So, if Shastra says something and you don't like it, still you have to accept it. You can't water it down, you can't change it so you feel better, it makes you feel better. Because ultimately, 
your spiritual life is at stake. That's Prabhupada's point. Then if we go down one, two, three, four paragraphs. Prabhupada quotes Gita 10.8, that I am the source of everything, everything comes from me, and then he says, here is a correct description of the Supreme Lord. The word Sarvasya Prabhava indicate Krishna is the creator of everyone, including Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. And because these principal deities of the material world are created by the Lord, the Lord is creator of all that exists in the material and spiritual world. Now in this purport, this purport is interesting. And Prabhupada does this a lot in the Gita. He quotes shloka after shloka after shloka after shloka after verse from this Shastra and that Shastra, just describing Krishna as the Supreme Personality of God. And so in this purport, Prabhupada just is, I'm not going to read them all, but he's just quoting one verse after another. Krishna is the Supreme Personality of God. Why? Because people don't know it. And because Prabhupada said, I'm trying to get Krishna in everyone's mind and heart, and that's the, that's the job of the devotees, to give people the Krishna disease. And you have the Shiva disease, the Durga disease, this one and that one. We want to show you who is supreme. So this purport, verse after verse after verse, Krishna is the supreme. Um, and then again, Prabhupada in this purport is talking about who is a bona fide guru, who you should listen to. One who's dira, you can't listen to these people, so-called guru, but look at their lifestyle. How are they living? They're not dira. You should only hear from the dira. They're qualified. And then, uh, yeah. So here's here's that statement. We'll go down, I didn't count how many, per, how many verses, how many paragraphs down, but this is, paragraph begins, the simple way to worship the Supreme Lord, and I'm going to read the last sentence, the last two sentences. Instead of hearing of the activities of Lord Krishna, such pseudo-spiritual masters advertise themselves by inducing their followers to sing about them. In modern times, the number of such pretenders has increased considerably, and, a, and it has become a problem for the pure devotees of the Lord to save the masses of people from the unholy propaganda of these pretenders in pseudo-incarnation. So that's, that's the challenge, and that's, that's why 